Good morning, everyone. My name is Todd Kimball, and I'll be your MC today. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. And this, for some of us, will be hopefully our final Zoom meeting. We plan to be back at the Friendly House next week for those that would like to join us in person and are able. And many of you know, if you remember back a year and a half ago, that I was famous for my pre-meeting stories as people got seated. I haven't done that as much via Zoom, but I need to get back in practice. So today, I'm gonna to talk to you about an idea I have, which is both going to end war as we know it and raise the ratings of the Olympics. Now, here's how it'll work. Each country chooses a sport that they dominate and a region that they are willing to sacrifice. So <clears throat> normally the US would have chosen say Montana or West Virginia and chosen men's basketball. But clearly we need to shift our sport there. Maybe women's basketball, possibly women's gymnastics would be our sport of this Olympics. And if we lose, whatever country beats us takes over our designated area. So <clears throat> this really would in increase the, uh, the global cooperation of the world. It would end wars and it would raise the profile and the ratings of the Olympics. So a reminder that humanists believe that the ultimate goal should be the fulfillment of the potential for growth in each human personality, not for the favored few, but for all of humankind. And humanists urge the use of reason and compassion to produce the kind of world we want, a world in which peace, prosperity, freedom, and happiness are widely shared. Our reader today is Mr. Lawrence Beauregard. Lawrence. The reading this morning has a title. It's called Personal Relationship with Jesus. And it is literally a reading from a book that uh, I was reading recently. Uh, by um, two authors. One is a father and son. The father is a, a religious person who's a honcho in, the, uh, in religion, and his son is a, a humanist, in fact, a humanist counselor. And so this is a conversation between father and son coming from totally different camps. And so the title of the book is Why I Left, comma, Why I Stayed. And the subtitle is Conversations on Christianity Between an Evangelical Father and His Humanist Son. And again, the title is Personal Relationship with Jesus. It's, uh... So on the dust cover of this book, we have this description. Over a Thanksgiving dinner, Bart announced to his famous evangelical father, Tony, that after a lifetime immersed in the Christian faith, Bart no longer believed in God. Now we skip over to page 90. And this is being written by the son, the humanist son. Quote, I spent many years hearing and preaching about the critical importance of an intimate personal relationship with Jesus. And a little bit later in the book, among the many important things I don't know about Jesus are the following, whether he was a good carpenter, how he felt about Joseph not being his real father, his sexual orientation, his perspectives on slavery, abortion, and war, his favorite kind of anything, his sense of humor, his best friend, why he raised Lazarus from the dead but nobody else, what he thought of between the crucifixion and the resurrection, and why he did not make sure that at least one of his disciples took better notes. In any case, the whole idea of having an intimate personal relationship with a spiritual being strikes me as highly unrealistic. Such relationships are hard enough for us human beings to form with one another after all. People ask, what would Jesus do? I have no idea. For goodness sake, I don't know what my wife would do half the time. And we've been intimately acquainted for 30 years. That's it. Thank you, Lawrence. You have... This morning, we are joined by two literary detectives and best-selling authors, 
Michael Blanding and Dennis McCarthy. What if Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare, but someone else wrote him first? That's the question Blanding and McCarthy explore in this provocative presentation based on the new nonfiction book, North by Shakespeare. Michael Blanding is an investigative journalist whose work has appeared in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, Wire, Slate, and more. In addition to North by Shakespeare, Blanding has written numerous other books, including the New York Times bestseller and NPR book of the year, The Map Thief, the gripping story of an esteemed rare map dealer who made millions stealing priceless maps. Dennis McCarthy is an independent researcher and author of Thomas Norse's 1555 travel journal from Italy to Shakespeare and Here by Dragons, the study of animal and plant distributions <clears throat> and how it revolutionized our views of life and earth. Let's All right, thank you so much for that great introduction and thank you for inviting us virtually across the country. We're coming to you from uh, Boston and uh, New Hampshire, respectively, and so it's nice to be able to, uh, you know, virtually take a take a flight this morning. Uh, morning for you, afternoon for us to uh, talk with you a little bit about my book and about uh, Dennis's research. So we're going to be splitting our time this hour. I'm going to go first, and I am going to give you a little bit of an overview of the book and talk to you about the two protagonists of the work one of whom is the rogue scholar of the title, Dennis McCarthy himself, and the other is the 16th century courtier and translator, Sir Thomas North. And uh, then I'm gonna turn it over to Dennis and he is going to get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of his research and explain some of his uh, really innovative and uh, unique uh, techniques that he has used to explore this, this question of this relationship between North and Shakespeare. Well, thank you again uh, so much for having us here today to talk about uh, this uh, really uh, bold hypothesis. Uh, I was first introduced to Dennis about six years ago. He approached me after a reading for my last book, The Map Thief, and he told me that he had a new idea about how Shakespeare wrote his plays. And initially I started sort of slowly backing away from him, thinking that he was some conspiracy theorist who was gonna say that Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare. But uh, it turns out that he actually has a um, really unique and uh, somewhat elegant theory that explains a lot of the mysteries about the plays that uh, people have never been able to understand before, such as how Shakespeare could have had uh, such a knowledge of of traveling in Italy or of being a soldier in war or, or why there's so many legal terms in Shakespeare. And that is that unlike those who believe that someone else wrote the plays like the Earl of Oxford or Sir Francis Bacon, Dennis believes that Shakespeare wrote the works attributed to him, but that he based them on earlier plays written by this other writer, Sir Thomas North. And again, when he first proposed this idea to me, I was very skeptical and uh, you know, I, I didn't, wasn't inclined to, to believe him. I thought this is a sort of outlandish idea, but I agreed to look at anything that he wanted to send me and, and see what I thought of it. And one of the things that he sent me early on was this information that he had found about this new manuscript that no one had really looked at before. Dennis and his collaborator, June Schluter, found this manuscript in the British Library. And it is a text written by a 16th century writer by the name of George North. And by using computer techniques, uh, comparing this manuscript to Shakespeare's plays, Dennis identified it as the source for 11 of Shakespeare's plays, including King Lear, Macbeth, Henry V, Richard III, and many others. And he ended up writing a book about this with June Schluter. And uh, I was uh, very intrigued by it and by his techniques. And I ended up writing an article about it for the New York Times. And it actually made the front page of the New York Times under the headline plagiarism software unveils a new source for 11 of Shakespeare's plays. And I'll get a little bit more into the, what the plagiarism software is in, in, in a moment. But this article was very well received as was Dennis's books. Uh, scholars were very uh, intrigued by this idea of this new undiscovered source for Shakespeare that no one had never known about before. 
And indeed, the director of the Folger Shakespeare Library called it a once in a generation or maybe several generations find. So it was very well received and, and you know, he was looked upon as really being onto something here. However, this is only a small part of Dennis's uh, theories, which was that Shakespeare actually never saw this manuscript by George North but that it was actually used by a cousin of George by the name of Thomas North. And that Thomas North actually used this manuscript as well as a whole lot of other sources to write these early source plays that Shakespeare adapted into his own work. I should mention there's no extant portrait of Thomas North, so I cheated a little bit. I got a sketch artist to create a composite based on other family portraits. So this is now the uh, official portrait of Thomas North as far as I'm concerned. But, uh, again, here's the two uh, protagonists of, of my book, North by, by Shakespeare. And, um, you know, it seems like a uh, outlandish theory, as I said, to uh, basically speculate on the existence of these lost plays by this, this other writer that Shakespeare adapted. But when you really look at it, it's not that, um, it's not as crazy as it first seems. Uh, first of all, Shakespeare used sources for nearly every one of his plays. As Bill Bryson has said, Shakespeare was a wonderful teller of stories so long as someone else had told them first. Among the sources that we know he used were Italian novellas, the English histories of Holland, Shed, and Hall, and indeed the book Plutarch's Lies, which was a collection of Greek and Roman biographies by the uh, Greek scholar Plutarch that was translated by Sir Thomas North in, in, 1580s, in the 1580s. And in fact, many scholars even believe that Shakespeare used source plays for many of his works, that he was not just drawing upon these prose works, but actually using plays and adapting them. There have been early uh, versions of Romeo and Juliet, Two General Verona, Much Ado About Nothing, The Merchant of Venice, Titus Andronicus, the list goes on that scholars have identified, which are plays that are now lost. But we have references in them to from the various court and theatrical records uh, about these plays that have either similar titles or similar plots, similar characters to Shakespeare's plays that scholars believe Shakespeare took and adapted. And in addition, there's a number of plays that still exist today that are extant that we might think of as companion plays to Shakespeare. They have similar names, similar plot lines, similar characters to many of the plays. And it's an open question about whether Shakespeare used those as a source, whether they use Shakespeare as a source, or whether they were both drawing from a now lost other source. And Dennis's belief is that Shakespeare indeed did use source plays for all of his works, but where he really parts company with scholars and where, where he really becomes controversial is in believing that they were all written by this other writer, Sir Thomas North. So who was North? He was born in 1535, about 30 years before Shakespeare, and he was raised in Tudor luxury at Kirtling Hall, the largest estate in Cambridgeshire. He was the son of Edward, the first Lord North, who was the chancellor of the Court of Augmentations under Henry VIII. And uh, the Court of Augmentations is interesting because it was in charge of something called the Dissolution of the Monasteries, which some of you may uh, have heard about, which is basically the destruction of the Catholic Church under Henry VIII. And, and Thomas North's father, Edward, oversaw that. And he became very wealthy as, uh, as uh, the person who was in charge of that. Edward was also one of the first generation of humanist scholars in England. He was one of the first to go to school and learn uh, classical Greek and start to study these uh, classical tests that were sort of flowing in from, uh, from Italy. And his son Thomas continued that education by attending school at Lincoln's Inn, one of the inns of court, which were sort of the uh, law schools in Tudor society. But they were also sort of this breeding ground for humanist philosophy and wisdom uh, there were a number of, of writers and scholars who were translating these works that were coming from Italy, uh, of these classical works by authors like Seneca, Plutarch, Ovid. And uh, Thomas North was uh, particularly interested in this type of literature that's known as speculum principis literature, which is uh, called a mirror for princes is the translation from the Latin. And it looks at what it takes to be a good ruler and sort of giving advice to people at court about how you can be a good ruler. 
And unlike previous generations that sort of believed in the divine rights of kings and you know, this very hierarchical society, these new humanist scholars started looking at rulership as really a privilege of being a servant to the people and looking at how you could order a good society that would uplift uh, all, of your, all of your subjects and how you could really um, uh, put that into place and either succeed or fail as a ruler, depending on uh, these, these terms. And one of the works that Thomas North translated at Lincoln's Inn was called The Dial of Princes, which was supposedly based on a work by Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor, but was really by a, a Spanish bishop, but it was heavily invested in these questions. Later, he had a very colorful life. He was a diplomat to Italy and France and a soldier in Ireland and the Netherlands. And I sort of call him the zealot of the 16th century. He seemed to be at the right place in time for all of these amazing uh, events with these amazing personages like Catherine de Medici, Mary Queen of Scots, uh, Philip Sidney, Edmund Spencer, and, and Queen Elizabeth herself. He seemed to, to sort of be brushing shoulders with all of these really amazing personages. He uh, himself was um, uh, dedicated his works to a man named Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester, who was sort of the Queen's favorite and spent his whole life trying to woo Queen Elizabeth and unsuccessfully make her his wife. And uh, his brother was uh, Roger, the second Lord North, who was also very high up in court, became the treasurer to Queen Elizabeth. But it seems that Thomas and Roger had some sort of a falling out and he was disowned at a certain point and died in, in poverty. So that's what we know about Thomas North and his life and just kind of give you like a thumbnail sketch. But already you can sort of see all of these elements that are in Shakespeare's plays, which we have no evidence that Shakespeare had experience with himself, like travel in Italy, like fighting as a soldier in war. Uh, experience with court life and history. Uh, Dennis, um, on the other hand, um, was not trained as a Shakespeare scholar. He, uh, in fact, didn't even graduate from college. But he is one of these people that is just intensely interested in whatever field he uh, comes across. And uh, early in, earlier in his life, he really latched on to the field of biogeography and looking at plant and animal species and how they evolve and how they travel uh, around the world and sort of what explains why certain species are found where they are. And surprisingly enough, it's this topic that led him to look at Shakespeare's source study. Because after he wrote this book, Here Be Dragons, uh, for Oxford University Press, he wanted to write a last chapter that looked at how stories move around the world and if he could apply some of these same principles of evolution and geography to storytelling. And he decided to look at Shakespeare's Hamlet and examine how the story behind Hamlet moved from being an 11th century Norse legend to, the, in the early 17th century, Shakespeare's masterpiece. And along the way, he discovered evidence about another play, a source play for Hamlet that's recognized by scholars who refer to it as the Ur Hamlet. And it's referred to in 1589, 14 years before Shakespeare's play. And Dennis believed that if he looked hard enough and long enough, he could determine who wrote this earlier Hamlet. And by following a series of clues, which I go into in the book, but I, I won't go into here, he determined that it was actually Thomas North who was the author of this earlier or Hamlet play. And when he looked at Thomas North's book, The Dial of Princes, which he wrote at Lincoln's Inn, he found all of these passages that seem to have uncanny similarities to passages in Hamlet including Hamlet's most famous soliloquy. In the Dial of Princes, North asks, is it better that thou die or that thou escape and live? Hamlet says, to be or not to be. North talks about the assaults of life and broils of fortune, like Hamlet talks about the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. They both talk about a sea of troubles. And North talks about sleeping as a pilgrimage uncertain from which none returned. And Hamlet talks about death as the undiscovered country from which no traveler returns. So it seemed like in this passage and others, there were just all of these direct uh, relationships of where this humanist wisdom that was reflected in Thomas Norris' works was making a uh, was was making its um, uh, uh, appearance in uh, in Hamlet. And indeed, if you Google Hamlet and humanism, you'll find a thousand hits about how Hamlet is sort of this reinterpretation of humanist philosophy as Hamlet sort of uh, comes to grips with his mortality in 
uh, in facing, you know, whether he is going to uh, take up arms against his uh, usurping uncle who was, who was married, his, killed his father and married his, his mother. As Depp started looking, though, at other works from the time, he began finding more connections between North and Shakespeare that were all sort of couched in these kind of satirical pamphlets of the time and these kind of allusions and allegories. Um, one of them in particular seemed to show a relationship between Shakespeare and this other uh, author of uh, this other scholar. And um, it's a work called Green's Grossworth of Wit. And it's sort of famous for referring to this actor known as Shakespeare, and it calls him an upstart crow who beautifies himself with the feathers of others. And some scholars have interpreted this as uh, pointing to the fact that Shakespeare was a plagiarist or was in, in any case sort of stealing work from others and passing it off it as his own. And in this work there, if you read it further, there's this reference to this gentleman scholar who has this interaction with this country actor Shakespeare, and, and the actor says that men of my professions get by scholars their whole living. And the scholar says, by how do you mean to use me? And the actor says, why, sir, in making plays for which you will be well paid. And again, it just shows in this kind of uncanny way, this relationship of Shakespeare to this other uh, scholar who was born as a gentleman. And there's all these other references that also seem to refer to Norse life and the life of his family also in this work. But uh, Dennis sort of took this to, uh, to signify a larger relationship between Shakespeare and North that went beyond one play. and, and uh, and actually encompassed many of Shakespeare's plays. And one of the tools that he used to further investigate this connection, as I said, is uh, plagiarism software, where he took the complete text of North's works and the complete text of Shakespeare's plays and compared them to each other. And when he did, he started finding just uh, literally hundreds of phrases in common and um, these phrases were not just sort of randomly scattered throughout the text, but they were grouped in passages that seemed like Shakespeare was drawing directly from North's work. And I've already mentioned that Shakespeare used Thomas North's Plutarch's Lives as a source for his Roman plays, Antony and Cleopatra, Julius Caesar, and Coriolanus. But it's amazing when you look, when you use this plagiarism software and you look side by side at these passages, everything in red is what's in common between these two texts. And it's just almost a line by line sort of an adaptation of Norse works into this play. And you see this in all of the Roman plays in a way that Shakespeare does with no other writers. He doesn't do this with Holinshed in the English histories. He doesn't do with this with the Italian novellas. He only seems to do this with North. But in addition, as Dennis started using the plagiarism software and looking at other plays, he started finding, as I said, just hundreds of passages that went beyond just Plutarch's lies, went beyond just the Roman plays, but encompass every one of Shakespeare's plays and every one of Norse translations. And this is Dennis's uh, website, which I'm just scrolling through here. And I know you can't read these passages as they fly by, but I just wanted to give you a sense for just how, uh, how much borrowing there is between Shakespeare and Thomas North that goes far beyond what other scholars have identified. Everything in red there are passages and phrases that appear in both uh, Shakespeare and North. And it led Dennis to one of two conclusions. Either Shakespeare is obsessed with the writings of Thomas North and had his works open before him when he was writing all of his plays, or indeed Thomas North was using his own writings to write plays that Shakespeare was then adapting uh, like he did these, um, these other plays. And the reason that he started leaning towards the second hypothesis was that it wasn't only Thomas North's works that he saw reflected in the plays, but he also started seeing uncanny elements of Thomas North's life reflected in the plays as well. One of them occurred in 1551, which was a murder that took place. This woman by the name of Alice Arden murdered her husband, and it was sort of the murder of the century, the biggest scandal in, in Tudor England at the time. And uh, it was so scandalous that it was written about in Hollandshed, and then 40 years later, there was a play that was made about this murder called Arden of Faversham. And this play has been recognized by some scholars as being Shakespeare's first play. It was published anonymously, but three years ago in the Oxford Shakespeare, it was actually attributed to Shakespeare for the first time. Why is this uh, related to Thomas North? Well, Alice Arden was actually Thomas North's stepsister. And the whole background of the play deals with the dissolution of the monasteries, which Thomas North's father was intimately involved in. And as Dennis applied his plagiarism software, he found, uh, again, just 
uh, dozens and dozens of phrases in common between Arden of Faversham and the Dial of Princes, the work that Thomas North would have been working on at the time of the murder. Uh, I'll just point out one, which is the subtitle of the work itself. It says, wherein is showed the great malice and dissimulation of a wicked woman. And in North style of princes, he says, wherein is expressed the great malice and little patience of an evil woman. So the same idea expressed with many of the same words. And as Dennis looked in other databases of English literature, he found no one else had used these unique phrases next to each other in all of English literature. In 1555, Thomas North took part in a delegation to Rome on behalf of Queen Mary to reconcile the Church of England with the Pope. And along the way, he stopped at this church in which he saw these beautiful lifelike wax statues. And the same day he visited this palace, which were filled with these amazing frescoes with Greek gods and goddesses by the artist Giulia Romano. Why is this important? Because in the Winter's Tale, the uh, climax of the play is this statue that comes alive at the end of the play. And that statue was made by this rare Italian master, Giulia Romano. And there's even scenes in the play that feature a pastoral feast with some of the same gods and goddesses in these frescoes. And in fact, Dennis discovered another lost manuscript, a journal written by Thomas North about this delegation in which he describes a trip to Mantua and describes seeing these statues. And Dennis and June wrote another book in which they look at uh, the relationship, not just between this scene, but all kinds of other details in the journal and the play, The Winner's Tale, as well as the play, Henry, Henry VIII, which um, would have also been very relevant to Thomas North on this delegation to restore the church that Henry VIII broke with uh, at the time. Uh, I'll just give you uh, uh, one other example. In, in 1578, Thomas North wrote another translation called The Moral Philosophy of Doni. And this is sort of a strange book. It's an it's a animal collection of animal fables, sort of like Aesop's fables. But again, it was written according to this speculum principis uh, philosophy that all of these stories were seen as allegories about what makes a good ruler and, and what, you know, how you can act humanist principles in the rulership of your kingdom. Um, and in 1570, when Thomas North would have been going to Venice to acquire this book, uh, the, what was happening at the time, the Turks were inviting Cyprus, which was the backdrop to Shakespeare's play, Othello. And indeed, in the moral philosophy of Donny, there's this framing tale of this kind of duplicitous mule who kind of turns uh, this, uh, tries to turn the kingdom away from this uh, noble lion. And the way he does it is by uh, sort of using the lion's lieutenant, this, uh, um, this bull, and sort of turning him against the lion. And it it corresponds in really uncanny ways to the plot of Othello in which the evil uh, Iago tries to usurp the, the Venice from Othello and bring him about Othello's downfall by turning his lieutenant Cassio against him. And there's even language in the moral philosophy of Doni that seems directly lifted into Othello. So the mule talks to about uh, not being content to eat his provender, this sort of coarse animal feed and, and uh, Iago uses that same phrase about, uh, you know, some people are just content to eat not but, but the master's provender. The mule talks about, uh, tell me not of honesty or dishonesty, tut a fig. And Iago says, virtue a fig, tis in ourselves that we are thus or thus. The mule talks about a double treason. Iago talks about a double knavery. The mule talks about leading the bull by the nose. And Iago talks about leading Othello by the nose as asses are. So again, you know, it's just um, really uncanny how you see not only the events that would have been occurring in Thomas North's life when he was visiting Dennis and uh, visiting Venice in 1570, but also these uh, passages that seem drawn from this work that he was translating at the time. And now, in addition to Thomas North's own life, Dennis has also identified uh, elements of the life of Thomas North's patron, the Earl of Leicester who, as I said, was a longtime suitor of Queen Elizabeth and spent his whole life trying to, uh, to marry the queen. In particular, there was a festival that occurred in 1575 at Leicester's castle of Kenilworth, which many scholars identify as a source for Shakespeare's in Midsummer Night's Dream. And they see specific imagery and lines in Shakespeare's in Midsummer Night's Dream that refers to this festival. Of course, Shakespeare was only 11 years old at the time. So the question is, how could Shakespeare have known about this festival? Well, Thomas North would have attended with his brother who uh, was uh, Lester's closest friend at the time. 
In addition, um, there are all these references uh, that Dennis has uh, points to about other suitors that were also interested in Queen Elizabeth at the time that are sort of turned into villains of various Shakespearean plays that would have particularly pleased Lester if North was indeed writing plays for Lester. For example, in the 1560s, Elizabeth was wooed by Eric XIV, the King of Sweden, who was also known as the King of the Goths. And in Titus Andronicus, the villain is Tamora, Queen of the Goths. In the 1570s, she was wooed by Don John of Austria, the Habsburg uh, uh, bastard brother of King Philip of Spain. And in Much Ado About Nothing, the villain is Don John, who bears many similarities to Don John of Austria, and he's even called the bastard throughout the play. And then in the 1580s, uh, the biggest threat to Lester was the Francois Hercule, the Duke of Alençon and Anjou, the French prince who was uh, courting Queen Elizabeth. And in the English history plays uh, that Shakespeare wrote, there's very, um, uh, there's a lot of attention drawn to the villainous Duke of Alençon, an ancestor of that Duke of Alençon, as well as Margaret of Anjou, who's sort of the big villain of the Henry VI plays. And there's even a ancestor of Lester who becomes a hero in these plays that actually goes up against mano y mano with the Duke of Alençon. So again and again, you see these references that seem to refer to an earlier time before Shakespeare would have been writing his plays that directly relate to Thomas North's life. And he even draws a uh, allusion to the invasion of the Spanish Armada in 1588 to uh, some elements of the play Hamlet uh, in which, uh, which would have been written, you know, again, as referred to the Ur Hamlet in 1589, in which Thomas North was actually facing his own mortality in, uh, as one of the uh, people charged with defending against the Armada, just as Hamlet was facing his mortality in the play. So when I set out to write this book, you know, it's sort of an interesting challenge to write a book about a guy writing a book about a guy writing a book. Uh, I didn't think that it would really be that fun to just, you know, have the reader watch Dennis and I sit across the table and talk about Shakespeare for 300 pages. So I convinced Dennis to come with me to travel in England, to travel in Italy, and really explore some of these places firsthand. And it just so happened that his daughter was making a documentary about Dennis. She's actually a documentary filmmaker who, you know, is working for Oprah and the Disney Channel and things. And she's working on this documentary about her dad. And so we all decided to travel together. And she was filming him as I was interviewing him. And at the same time, we're all sort of imagining Thomas North in these, uh, these places. Here we are at Kenilworth Castle, which is this really picturesque ruin right now. There we are at Kirtling Hall, which uh, we actually weren't allowed to, to visit, but we, we are there. I assure you on public property outside of the, of the estate. Here we are in Mantua in Italy, uh, actually visiting some of these amazing frescoes at the Palazzo Te and this church in, in Mantua. And of course we had to go to Venice where we spent an afternoon tracing uh, Othello and a merchant of Venice. There's uh, Nicole, Dennis's daughter with her, her cameraman, Ian. And it really brought alive for me the experience of uh, what it would have liked, what it would have been like to visit these places and to think more clearly about how Thomas North may have been working these, uh, these experiences into plays that he was writing at the time. In addition, as an investigative reporter, I didn't want to take Dennis's own word for it. So I did a lot of my own research in the National Archives and uh, in the British Library, in uh, the libraries at Cambridge and Oxford, including looking at Thomas North's own copy of the Dial of Princes in which he wrote some of his own marginalia. And Dennis will talk about that in, in a minute. But um, in all of my research, I didn't find anything that contradicted Dennis's theory. And, and you know, believe me, I was looking for it. But I found a number of, of elements that actually supported his theory that he didn't even know about. And you know, what, what fascinates me about this idea is that it's not just one thing. It's not just the plagiarism software. It's not just the life. But it's all of these things taken together. It's Thomas North's life reflected in the plays. Thomas North's works reflected in the plays, these historical allusions to other figures that would have been from an earlier time than, than Shakespeare, and these humanist themes that would reflect the writings that Thomas North was uh, working on in ways that um, would sort of fit his concerns as a, as a playwright. And I just want to leave you with this idea that but looking at the plays through the lens of Thomas North and uh, his uh, generation of humanist scholars really sort of reinterprets them in a way that's really exciting and really fascinating. And it all swirls around this idea of what makes a good ruler. 
which Shakespeare, for whatever reason, just seems obsessed with in his plays, whether it's Richard III or Henry V and that contrasting, you know, uh, visions of rulership or King Lear rejecting his daughters or, or Macbeth deciding to kill his king, or even the, um, even many of the comedies, As You Like It deals with this Duke that's been deposed, The Tempest deals with this other Duke that's been deposed. When you really start looking at the plays through this lens, you start seeing this question, which was really sort of occupying everyone at the time and uh, giving new insight into examples of both, you know, terrible rulers, but also virtuous rulers and really seeing the contrast between them. So I will leave you there. And uh, as I said, I would like to introduce Dennis now, who's gonna go more uh, specifically into some of his techniques and talk about some of his scholarship itself. But I just wanted to give you that overview as well as some enticing ways that it might uh, relate to some of the uh, humanist concerns that I know is the, uh, is the focus on, on this group. Dennis, I hand it to you, take it away. Okay, again, thank you, Michael, very much for that presentation. Uh, I will be just getting into a few more details about how we know that Thomas North wrote plays later adapted by Shakespeare. First of all, um, we have to understand that there is a mystery to be solved. There were source plays, scholars do not deny this. They know that Shakespeare uh, did adapt old plays. All these are quotes from actual conventional scholars. They're all um, very pro Shakespeare and uh, well known in the Shakespeare community. And these are just some of their quotes, making it clear Shakespeare was an expert at remakes of old plays. And we know this because there's all sorts of allusions to uh, Shakespeare type plays long before he could have written them. So for example, there's a, uh, uh, a reference to a Romeo Juliet in 1562, which is two years before Shakespeare was born. And it's a reference to Romeo and Juliet on stage. Uh, Michael talked about the Ur Hamlet. There's a uh, famous reference by Thomas Nash to an early Hamlet 14 years before uh, Shakespeare wrote it. And just uh, many plays to where it's clear, as C.A. Greer said, he had a play for, uh, he had a source play for nearly all his plays. And what happened to them is, you know, as you see in this book, there's, uh, uh, they're all lost. There was pl plays were not printed at the time, particularly in the 1550s, 60s, uh, and 70s, the time when North was uh, writing most of his plays, including the 1580s. Shakespeare didn't even publish half of his plays. They were published post-mortem. Uh, most playwrights, Christopher Marlowe, Thomas Kidd, didn't publish plays. You find this out that well over 80% of all plays uh, from the era are now lost. But you say, well, if they no longer exist, what can you say about them? Which is a little like saying, well, dinosaurs no longer exist. What can you say about them? We do have their fossils. We do have uh, descriptions of them. And there's a lot of information. There wouldn't be, let me go back to this. There wouldn't be a book lost place in Shakespeare's England. It's not all blank. Uh, it actually can tell you a lot about what the plays must have been on and he, sometimes even who possibly wrote them. Uh, Jude Schluter and I, my better half, my collaborator, wrote uh, an article, for example, in Shakespeare's survey on a lost play called Titus and Vespasian, which we contend was Thomas Norris' uh, original version of Titus uh, Andronicus, and we showed all sorts of evidence that he wrote it in 1561. Why he wrote it, as Michael talked about, was warning um, Queen Elizabeth about marrying a Goth, and if there's any work in the history of English literature that warns against marrying a Goth, that's Titus Andronicus. And uh, this is very well received. The uh, reviewers and editors um, uh, were very complimentary about this article, and this is a uh, orthodox uh, peer-reviewed journal, Shakespeare Survey, and it shows you that they're willing to accept that Thomas North wrote one or two of the source plays that Shakespeare used. When you start getting more than that, people obviously start getting more and more uncomfortable. We also know that Thomas North was a playwright. I'm not gonna take you through this passage, but one of the reasons that we don't really, uh, here you see that 
the person is not writing, Thomas North was a great tragedian. You have to understand what, what they're saying that's North and uh, Dial Death of Princes refers to North Dial of Princes and instead refers to his painful pen and that Melpomene, the muse of tragedy, taught him how to write. And he's placed at a list here on the top of uh, uh, above uh, three other tragedians from the era. So there are references that Thomas North is not just a uh, translator, uh, but also wrote other works as well, particularly involved in tragedy. And uh, here's a receipt from Roger North's account book, which linked Thomas North to Lester's men. And there's all sorts of uh, uh, receipts. There's all sorts of records in that, uh, in that account book uh, showing, um, uh, showing payments at the same time to both Thomas North and Lesterman. This is for a 1580 production of a play at court. We know that he's paying Lesterman 40 shillings. That's Roger North's standard amount, 40 shillings uh, for a play at court. And then he gives to his brother at that point, three pounds, six shillings, four pence, which is uh, follows an earlier payment on the previous page of six pounds, 13 shillings, four pence, which is the standard dual payments to the penny for a play at court. So this is a receipt in which Roger North, Zach Court pays both Lester's men and Thomas North together. And he's paying Thomas North the typical price uh, that playwrights got when they had produced a play at court. So Thomas North is a playwright. The way I discovered it is uh, uh, Michael Blanding said, I studied this particular passage and I studied more and more passages. This is a reference to a Hamlet in 1589 and it's this English Seneca that wrote it. And when you start reading the entire passage, you find out he's repeatedly quoting Thomas North, punning on his name. And you see this in all sorts of satires from the era, from Thomas Nash, Ben Johnson, uh, Gabriel Harvey, Thomas Lodge, others all referring to Thomas North as his older playwright and that Shakespeare was now uh, adapting his plays. Even the upstart Crow reference about Shakespeare is that he's an up, he's, Crow is the Horatian symbol for plagiarism and it just shows that, uh, uh, that Shakespeare was indeed using old plays. Now, I ended up running, as Michael Blanding said, when I discovered that Thomas North was the author and I got this idea from Sir Brian Vickers of running all the works of Thomas North through plagiarism software uh, and all the works of Shakespeare. So you get to see all the matches. Right here, that's North's on the left. That's uh, uh, North's passage on the left. That's Shakespeare's passage on the right. This is in Coriolanus. And um, as you can see, it's just, it's just line by line. But what happened was we found hundreds and hundreds of examples. And this is not normal and it cannot be denied. This is an unusual instance. It's a unique instance in the history of English literature that any writer has ever borrowed this much from an earlier writer. Here's an example from Othello. And let me explain very quickly why this can't be any other thing. And this is by the way, a humanist passage. Uh, and it's about the thieves of reputation being uh, uh, doing more harm than a thief of property. And the line, the passages in both cases end, they're talking about the good, round, good renown or good name. The passages both end with uh, the thief that sealed my neighbor's gown is hanged forthwith, but he that robbeth me of my good name walketh still before my door. That's Thomas North. And you have someone, well, Shakespeare saying, who steals my purse? This is Iago and Othello. Who steals my purse steals trash. And just like North, but he that filters from me my good name robs me of. If you notice, but he that robs me of my good name in juxtaposition, you can search this on early English books online. Has anyone else juxtaposed that line, uh, those phrases together? You can check it on Google, search but he that near my good name, uh, and you will find no other results in the history of the English language other than Othello and Thomas North. Dial of Princes. And you see this again and again and again, passage after passage. And you saw Michael Blandin go, uh, go through uh, many, of the, many of the scenes. But again, no other writer, we have looked through all the greatest examples of plagiarism or literary influence in history. 
um, whether it's uh, with Tristan Shandy uh, and Robert Burton or whoever, whatever the most, and it's not even close to the amount of passages taken from North. Here's another one from Henry VIII, which ends, it's on the same subject, it's the exact same context, and it's the exact same line, both ending with word that I never, truly, sir, I never uttered word that might be to the prejudice of, uh, word that might be the prejudice of any, that appears nowhere else in the history of the English language, except in Thomas North style and uh, Shakespeare's Henry VIII. And we could do this again and again with Milch Kind of the Pale in a list of Eastern riches and Taming of the Shrew. And here's one example. This is a, uh, more of a stoic passage. Uh, whether stoicism is actually a part of humanism is up for debate, but this is a stoic passage on grief from Norse Nepo's lives. And uh, it's the exact same passage. What is significant about this, and this is where we're gonna get into smoking guns, is that William Shakespeare was not only borrowing passages from everything that North published and everything, he was also borrowing from, from works that North had yet to publish. Nepo's Lives wasn't published till 1602. Richard II was published in five years sooner. So whoever wrote this passage, and we know that North's passage had to come first because he's following a translation. Whoever wrote the playwright, the playwright who wrote that passage in Richard II on grief, and it's about griefs of the inward soul and seeing things in water and ending with dissolving the bands of life, that quote, whoever wrote that had to write it after Thomas Norris and had to be following Thomas Norris' uh, translation. So the, so the author had uh, access to Thomas Norris' translation before he published it. We also have an example from Thomas Norris' journal. I'm not going to go through this, but... Thomas North, um, we found, June Schluter and I found his journal of a trip to Italy, uh, written in 1555, never published till centuries later. And clearly, clearly Henry VIII and Winter's Tale, but here's an example from Henry VIII, is borrowing from it. This particular example is on a consistory, which is a meeting of the Cardinals with the Pope, and it's specifically about the seating arrangements of a consistory and a cardinal parade in which it's described row by row, the marchers and the different uh, ceremonial objects that are carried before, uh, before the marchers. Again, there's no way that this is a coincidence. There's no other passage like this in history. There's almost no one that we can find that even described these two events. They're rarely ever seen together. Let alone, except for you find it in North's journal and you find it in a stage direction for Henry VIII. So it's not just that there's hundreds of passages and that there's a unique literary relationship between William Shakespeare and Thomas North that we see in no other writer that's followed any other writer. We also see that it occurs in Thomas North's unpublished material. Michael Blanding also found and sent me pictures of every page of uh, North Island Princes, which Thomas North himself marked in his passage, he noted this, marked himself. So we have North's own copy of his own Dial of Princes, which he wrote about in the notes, which he wrote about in the margin and underlined. And these passages are then saved and were then put into the place, many of the passages. This is the line, uh, wherein is expressed the great malice and little patience of an evil woman. As uh, Michael Blanding had noted, this was used that year. It's the same year that he's underlining it, the same year, 1591 to two, then 1592, Art of Favor Shame comes out. And it has that subtitle. Again, no one else in the history of the English language has ever written anything like this. And you can look for this on Google or on Early English Books Online. These are the only two people. This is necessarily where the subtitle comes from and by the way, the tragedy is about Thomas Norris' half-sister. So it's his words that he's marked in his book, and it's about his, uh, the murder that is, uh, of Alice Arden's murder of her husband. Alice Arden is his half-sister, and she did it with a North family servant. She committed the murder. And uh, you have another passage here. Here's another example where he's underlining passages. This is again in Arden of Faversham, and he's using those passages. So 
the basic outline is that we do know there is a mystery to solve. These source plays did exist. Someone had to write them. We know that North was a playwright. We know that satirist identified North as the author. North lived the plays, and that's especially shown in North by Shakespeare. And more, all of his passages are in the plays, and there are seven smoking guns. There's the North Family Manuscript, which we didn't even get into. That's another one, which is a major source for Shakespeare plays. That's a George North Manuscript. In fact, and Michael Blanding wrote the article on it, made the front page of the New York Times. Uh, it was an important source. And again, scholars were very happy to find that. But the only reason we found that is because we were looking for manuscripts that might be kept, at, that were kept at the North Family Library that would have been used as a source. Thomas North's Travel Journal is another, uh, another smoking gun, never published, and passages are used from the journal. Uh, North's Marginal Notes, as we talked about, and the use of Nepo's Lives, and there's more smoking guns coming. Dennis and Michael, that was fantastic. Very well researched, very convincing, and a very entertaining presentation. Uh, I'll ask the first question. Uh, we live in a country right now where um, it's very divided, and even when presented with facts, uh, it just doesn't seem to take hold in the, in the country. And so my question is, what kind of uh, backlash have you received by <laughs> some for your work? Dennis, do you want to take this for starters? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I was even telling Michael that, because my... Michael doesn't get many bad reviews. He's been, his works are beloved. And <laughs> I was telling Michael after this one, you're still gonna get great reviews because there's gonna be a lot of people who know, uh, but you're gonna have, you're gonna have some tough, uh, you're gonna have some tough critics. And uh, he was cut. So some of the, you know, some of the people, look, I understand people have, become, have an emotional attachment to William Shakespeare and their particular idea. And I usually like to say, William Shakespeare was adapting him. He's making him great for the stage. If it weren't for him, these works would not have been uh, preserved. Uh, but um, they have an emotional attachment. Many people do to their own view of Shakespeare and they, and some of them are absolutely enraged by this, even though they don't have a candidate. <laughs> for say the first Romeo and Juliet or Hamlet or Merchant of Venice in which we know existed. They just are hoping to God it's not Thomas North. And, uh, <laughs> you know. I mean, one of the things in my book that I, that I really wanted to explore was this idea of how does knowledge get created and, and how, how do people react when somebody sort of goes against their established view of knowledge and, um, you know, the, the answer is with anger. I mean, it's been really fascinating in some ways. <laughs> Dennis will sort of reveal a small part of his theory, like the George North manuscript or like, you know, a certain number of passages, and he will get praise from scholars that will say, yes, you know, you, you've done it. The Titus Andronicus is an example. But as soon as he starts saying, well, actually, it was all of the plays that Shakespeare was adapting, he has um, gotten this level of animosity that just becomes very personal, very ad hominem, very quickly. And I, you know, I've written about uh, gun rights before and I've had the NRA come after me, but it's been nothing compared to some of these Shakespeareans that have come after me since I've written this book. It's just like, you know, um, uh, very personal and very reactive towards this idea of, you know, William of Shakespeare from Stratford, this, you know, genius who sort of pulled himself up from his bootstraps. It's a very compelling, romantic ideal of a writer that people are just not going to give up very easily. And so it's been, it's been really been an education for me to be on the receiving end of that. Thank you. We have the questions flowing in. Our first question is from Al Christians. Uh, yes, um, it seems to me that this story is really a story of specialization of labor, that it really took two guys to, to do Shakespeare's plays. Uh, you know, the, the question before about Shakespeare was, well, how could a guy who spent all his life working in the theater know all this stuff about the whole world? Right. Well, you've answered that question, and that's, that's, that's good. I guess if that's a good answer, that's right. But I wonder about the, the specialization part in particular. The thing about Shakespeare that you know is said to be remarkable was 
the extent of his vocabulary mm -hmm. and the number of words that he added to the English language. And in terms of the specialization of labor, uh, was it North or was it Shakespeare who who contributed that that to his works? And uh, uh, does this does any of this overlap into the sonnets or any of that work? Yeah, I I do. I'm working on this. Those are great points. Every single point you made. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right about the specialization and that. Uh, William Shakespeare was a theater person through and through, and he's working hours. He's putting on the plays, performing them, et cetera, and he's doing it from 1590s uh, uh, through the uh, early 1600s. So, how does he know about all of these little details about, say, Italy, which is one, of, which is the most famous? And not, it's not that you you can, of course, write great works without being educated or having traveled. But you can't know that St. Gregory's Well is just outside of Milan. You can't know about the statues of Giulio Romano. You can't know about all of this little information, the, story, the murder of Gonzago, which they can't even find in any English source or Italian source. It, it, all this inside information about Italy, where did it come from? And you got that with the law and war, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a great point. On, on the vocabulary, I'm working on this right now, and a lot of the words are coming. What the, many of the words that are being invented are are just taking foreign words, French words, uh, Italian words, and turning them into English words, and they are often from what Thomas North is translating. So, deracinate is a is a deracinate the savagery is a line I believe in Henry the Fourth one and uh and fourth part two and deracinate comes from Jacques Amiot he's writing that particular passage reminds the playwright of something in Plutarch's lives so he's caught so it's borrowing from Plutarch's lives and then right where Racine Sauvages and deracinaire which is a French word to unroot deracinate Racine is French for root Right where he's copying the passage, there is in Jacques Amiot's French version of Plutarch's Lives, which North is translating, is, you know, De Racinaire, Sauvages. And so you see De Racinate, the Savagery. It comes, a lot of those words are a translator using the foreign words and Englishing foreign words that, um, uh, that he needed to use at that point in time. All right, sorry. I did that. And one of the things that I found interesting when you talk about specialization is, so I did a lot of my own background reading to see, you know, is this something that is plausible, what Dennis is saying? Is it possible that a, that a theater producer could be taking these plays and adapting them? And it turns out that this kind of thing was done all the time, that, you know, it won't surprise you to learn that writers at the time were not very, uh, you know, looked very highly upon in the theater. And it's almost like a... Um, also analogy to sort of a modern day director and a screenwriter where you sell a script and then the director takes it and can kind of do whatever they want with it and they're doing rewrites on the fly and they're editing it and these plays would change over time they would take a production on the road and they would you know have two less actors so they would cut out two characters or they would add characters for plays at courts and these plays were these living breathing documents that were constantly being adapted and put together and taken apart and it just, that kind of thing just made sense to me when I read about it, because it's a lot of what we see today. And Dennis uses an analogy, which, which isn't, isn't perfect, but it kind of gives you a sense for um, what this relationship may be like that, you know, it's almost like Peter Jackson adapting J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, that the Lord of the Rings is an amazing work that, you know, you can uh, read, but it's also an amazing movie when it's on the screen, but it's a, it's a completely different work that, you know, has been adapted in, in a new form. And, you know, it could be like this, that Thomas North was writing these plays for Lester and Stan, they were presented at court for Queen Elizabeth, and then they were taken to the public theater later when that sort of emerged uh, decades later, and Shakespeare was taking that and maybe adding some body scenes, maybe, you know, cutting out some characters, streamlining the action, adding more sword fights, and making it into the plays that we know today. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to piece that out. I know Dennis has been working on it, June Schluter has been working on it, trying to figure out what's North and what's Shakespeare, but it could be something like that kind of uh, arrangement. The next question comes from David Danucci. Um, it, it seems to me you guys have presented a completely uh, 
solid case or or uh, Kev, uh, um, Dennis has and and Michael with all this support um, and it seems just totally unrealistic to me that anybody could be con contending this I mean it just there's um, if you just take probability into account I mean it's just the probability would be ridiculously small that this would not be true so and you've already mentioned how um, how how extreme the resistance is and how you know angry and whatever else people get on this I almost wonder if if that can be a completely separate lesson learned in all of this of just you know how you can present all the evidence for a certain fact or a certain uh, case and and it obviously goes in that direction and yet people will find ways to resist it in some way and of course we can we can bring parallels to religion and things into this uh, but I'm just wondering if you have any overall kind of uh, observations on that sort of thing yeah, I, I go into that a lot in, in my book because it is fascinating to me. As a reporter, I really try to stay unbiased. I try to stay skeptical throughout the whole book. And even in the last chapter, I don't draw a conclusion one way or another about whether Dennis is right. But clearly you can see just from you know listening to me talk about it, how persuaded I am and how compelling I find the evidence. And it's it's that, you know if it were any one or two or three things, you know, that would be interesting, but it's just over and over and over, you know, every play, the works, the life, the philosophy. And what's fascinating and it's fascinating to me and I'm sure frustrating to Dennis is to see how people will just dismiss it with, you know, they'll say, oh, well, we don't have any evidence that North was a playwright or we don't have these plays or, you know, okay, there's some phrases, but um, maybe they're, you know, these were just common phrases that were in use at the time or something. And we'll use that to just kind of put on blinders and, and dismiss the, the, the whole thing without really looking at it. And that's why I wanted to write this book was to sort of lay all the evidence out systematically and be like, okay, you know, read this. But it's, it's amazing how, you know, especially these scholars who have lived their whole life and written books and papers and gotten tenure and have this like, you know, investment, um, both intellectually and uh, financially, in a particular view of Shakespeare. It's this, you know, old uh, Upton Sinclair quote that, you know, uh, you, you can't, uh, what is it, you can't convince a, a man of something when his livelihood depends on him not being convinced, or I, I butchered the, the quote, but I'm sure you, you, you all know it. Uh, it's that kind of thing that, you know, people will just put on these blinders, and that's, it's fascinating to look at. We have a quick uh, clarification question from Suzanne. Uh, she asks, uh, what were the lifespans again of North and Shakespeare? Uh, Thomas North is 29 years older than Shakespeare. We don't know exactly when he died. He kinds of uh, around 1603 or 1604. Uh, we stopped hearing from him except for a possible 1607 reference. Um, and then, uh, Shakespeare lived till 1616. Uh, 16. Uh, he died at 53. Uh, Shakespeare, uh, and Thomas North, at least lived till um, uh, about 70. Okay. I had a quick question again, as we wait for others to come in. It seems to me that plagiarism software um, has done for literature what uh, DNA evidence yeah. did for criminal justice. So. Um, what other sort of literary controversies have emerged uh, because of this technology? Well, there's a subject uh, called forensic linguistics in which they um, in which they now can start getting ideas of odds uh, of uh, how uh, uh, percentages of what it's how unlikely it is for two lines or passages uh, to match. And a lot of times it is much more unlikely for even set, start, starting at seven word strings or eight word strings um, to, for those for two people to independently come up with these lines in the same context than the most amazing DNA analysis. If you, the OJ trial, it was like one in uh, 
170 million, but if you get with, for example, the Melania Trump and uh, Michelle Obama, it was one in uh, that those two speeches that were similar. The idea that that could be coincident that coincidental was one in seven septillion or something or five septillion. So I mean, it's they you can do with forensic linguistics, and it is really akin to DNA analysis. There's no doubt that that line is following from that line, and there's and it's and it's just simple probabilities. But plagiarism software, Brian Vickers is using it. Other people are using it to well, they're catching cheating students, um, and yeah. they're, uh, is one thing. But they also um, it, it it helps expose sources, source material, and is getting into authorship too. Thank you. We have a question from Helen Christians. Hi, uh, this is Helen. I'm just curious, is there any um, indication that um, Shakespeare would have spent time around, I mean, that they were connected uh, personally, that, that they both, because um, I'm just so curious, how did Shakespeare get a, attached to his journal that wasn't published? Like, how did he find it or get, you know, get, be able to read it? Right. Uh, Thomas did, Norris work. So he didn't read the journal. He was oh. just adapting Henry VIII. So Thomas North, the passage in Henry VIII that's linked and passages that are linked to the journal. Thomas North, um, Thomas North actually wrote into the play. Then when Shakespeare later adapted it, it still exists in the in the play. Uh, so they were uh, the way, for example, Groats of the Wit suggested is that. Uh, they're both in London at the same time. Okay. The uh, uh, Shakespeare has, and he's not just hiring Thomas North, he's hiring a stable of writers because they are producing 40 plays a year. The oh. other writers they know that Shakespeare worked with include Thomas Middleton, John Fletcher, uh, John Marson will come out soon, Thomas Nash. Uh, are these writers that helped uh, Shakespeare uh, produce the plays? And one of, the, one of his writers that he hired at the time Thomas North was absolutely broke. He had written all these plays for Lester's Men, which was his, uh, which was his patron. They're not well known around London because they're only seen by the uh, queen. At, at very private houses or in front of the queen. And Shakespeare then purchased them. And Thomas North was writing for him a little bit, doing some uh, work because North was going to starve. And he had all these plays that could then be reproduced for the public theater and Shakespeare adapted them. So was it, it the man that was going to starve was was not Thomas North? Though, Thomas right? North was, yes, he was out. He was, his brother stopped supporting him right around 15, uh, oh. 1590 or so. And, uh, uh, and really didn't even, he didn't even get anything from uh, Lord North in the will. The brother, Thomas didn't get anything from Roger in the will and was uh, so, uh, was so impoverished, he had to get relief money from Cambridge in 1598. Um, oh. And uh, it's one of the things, he, he, he led a riches to rags lifestyle. So yeah. <laughs> traveling around European palaces uh, throughout the, uh, starting from 1550s into the 1570s and he's, uh, and, and under Lester's wing, he was always taken care of. But Lester dies in 1588. He has a falling out with his brother and that relationship was always rocky who was the Lord North, who was the wealthiest man in Cambridge, and he's now starving. Starving. And, wow. and what's interesting, what you have to understand at the time is that this whole idea of plagiarism really didn't exist like the way that we, we think about it today, that you know the word plagiarism didn't even enter the English language until 1598. You know, these, it was perfectly acceptable to take another work and you know, buy it, rewrite it, and put your name on it. And, mm -hmm. um, it wasn't looked at as stealing in the way we think of. I mean, there may have been some sort of grumbling in that, you know, growth mm -hmm. worth of width about him being, you know, this, this crow. But, um, you know, the first plays that are published by Shakespeare are actually published anonymously. And then they start having this title like um, newly adapted by William Shakespeare, newly expanded, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And it's only later in Shakespeare's career that his name is sort of put on the, on the play. But, you know, again, there was there wasn't the same idea of authorship like we have today, at least in playwriting. 
And, you know, so it's conceivable to me that Thomas North would have sort of seen his legacy as his translations. These are the ones that he wants to put his name on. These are the ones that he looks at as his legacy forevermore. And then these plays that he was sort of writing for hire for Lester, mm -hmm. he would be perfectly comfortable sort of selling to Shakespeare and, and making some money off of. And of course, today, we, we can't imagine how, you know, Shakespeare's plays wouldn't be thought of as the pinnacle of literature, but right. they just plays just weren't looked at that way that time. Right. It's fascinating, just fascinating. Yeah. We have a question from Renga. Uh, I have two comments. The first is about plagiarism. I think there is also what is called an anti-plagiarism, you know, call it. Uh, you know, at least in uh, many other epics in India, there are people who have inserted their own work into the early works anonymously assuming that they want their writing to be somehow be prevalent. Nobody knows who did, did that. So it is actually the other way. They don't want to know they did it, but they want their work to be there and be read by other people. So that's some sort of anti-plagiarism has been there. The second thing I want to talk about is, you know, when we talked about this anger about, and also the reluctant to accept evidence I'm reminded that in every humanist meeting, we start with the thing saying that uh, we like to use reason for all of our behavior. But it's not that easy because we know that whether it be scholars or scientists, quite often their mood, their emotions and feelings or, or, or their beliefs sometimes overcome the evidence. There are several instances of that in science. So what one can hope for is we always aspire to use reason for most of our day-to-day -day decisions and, and our behavior. So we have to keep that in mind that it's not possible as a human being to be completely be using reason as your goal. If Michael I can, or Dennis, did you have a further comment on Rango's question or comments? Yeah, yeah, you know, and it is in science. What I when Michael was talking, when we we're talking about people not accepting, I went I went to a page. I was going to show a page in Here Be Dragons, which is about uh, which is Wegner's map of uh, uh, North America and South America fitting into uh, Europe and uh, uh, Europe and Africa. And how they come together and right where they come together you've got fossils and mountain ranges and uh geological things right across the map and wagner discovered this in 1912 he's got a book on it had a book on it on the uh origins of continents and oceans and uh uh that continents can move geophysicists didn't think continents can move this wasn't accepted until the 1960s and he died, Wagner dies unknown in 1930 in a blizzard in Greenland trying to prove his theories and, uh, and ridiculed all his life. And then, but then, I'm not comparing myself to there, but it is, but on, on, in terms of the emotions that stop people who have been, especially experts in the field who have gotten, whose books are there, it's both ego gratification and career and you know financial and intellectual incentives as michael blanding said it's very tough to overturn so i need good people like you helping me <laughs> we're doing an end run around the shakespeare community I think we're doing the, there is also the famous instance of the disagreement between einstein and niels bohr you know on the basic of quantum mechanics it's yeah. all there you know your belief system yeah yeah you know, when, one thing that, that I would add is that as a journalist, you know, a lot of what I do is to try to, to take arguments and, and, and tell stories about them that, that touch people's emotions. You know, I'm, I'm a narrative journalist, so I'm always writing these, these stories that sort of try to get at issues in an emotional way. And in some ways, that's what I do in, in this book by sort of showing you Dennis's journey and, you know, it's this real kind of underdog journey that, you know, against this, this establishment. But I would also argue that Thomas North's life story is, um, is so much more, um, it's so much richer 
emotionally speaking than Shakespeare's. And, you know, I haven't even gotten to some of the um, correspondences to some of the plays like The Tempest and As You Like It, in which Dennis um, feels like, like Thomas North was actually putting a lot more of himself and, and his family story about being disowned by his brother and, and his relationship with his daughter. And, um, you know, I actually, um, sort of became uh, throughout the course of writing of the book, you know, kind of emotionally invested in Thomas North and, and this experiences that he had had that sort of, he has kind of this tragic life story by the end that may be related in some of these great tragedies like King Lear or The Tempest in, in some ways. And so you, you raise an interesting point, Ranga, that, that uh, you know, maybe that's a way to reach people in, in this theory by sort of emphasizing some of those, some of those elements, those more emotional elements that may appeal to people's sense of, of storytelling and, and uh, uh, much more interestingly than, you know, William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon, who just left, you know, Stratford at age, you know, 18 and went to London and wrote plays, period. <laughs> it's fitting that our final question today come from our technical producer and current president, Mr. David DiNucci. Um, I, I was just wondering, I mean, it seems to me that you have done a great job here and yes you can keep adding more and more evidence but it seems like to me like any reasonable person would already see that you've got enough evidence um so i'm kind of wondering where you would branch off from here what kind of interests you'd have i just heard that i mean even the life of thomas north in more detail might might have interest um you know, are you thinking more Shakespeare stuff? Are you thinking of applying this same kinds of reasoning to other, other situations? Uh, uh, what what kind of things are you considering? Yeah, I'm I'm definitely going back into science. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I definitely going back into science when this is done, um, and particularly back into biogeography. I think there's some mistakes about the way we, on the evolution of the Pacific, but that's another story. And um, uh, but. Uh, I still have a lot of ways to go. I, the sonnets, someone asked about the sonnets. Yeah, I've got a book on the sonnets I got to get out. I've got to explain that. I've got to, uh, and I'm thinking of just individual plays in which, for example, Hamlet by Thomas North, in which you show the original Hamlet, how it went and how it exactly fits into his life in 1588 and what's happening. And As You Like It by Thomas North. And a few of those editions, and if those start, well, if those start supplanting the actual uh, sales of Hamlet's, um, I might actually uh, get into the black on this. <laughs> <laughs> and for my part, you know, I'm, I'm an investigative journalist. I'm a narrative nonfiction writer, and and so I'm always looking for sort of like what's the what's the next story. I mean, I talked about my other story, my other best book, The Map Thief, which was uh, also about an and outsider York. and and kind of went together history and, and a modern day story, although he's a, a much less uh, sympathetic protagonist, let's say. Um, but um, yeah, so I'm always looking for kind of what my next story is going to be. But I have to say, you know, I haven't given up on this one either. And I'm still regularly in contact with Dennis and June and, and really uh, interested to continue seeing what, what they uncover and also seeing if there's ways that I can contribute myself and maybe, you know, finding another document somewhere that will show, you know, blow this thing wide open. But, um, you know, it's something that I think is going to be a long process. And I'm just, you know, grateful that Dennis sort of let me in on uh, the, the, the process and that I can that I can be a part of it. Michael and Dennis, thank you so much today. This was a fun, engaging, convincing conversation. We really appreciate you being here today. Oh, thank you very thank much. Thank you so much for having us. It's been a great, great audience.